Hello, everyone, and welcome to our presentation, Working to Build Resilient and Viable Latinx Farm Businesses. This is a collaborative project with Ecotrust and Viva Farms. And I'm Anna Chotzen. I'm the business and marketing manager with Viva Farms. And I just really want to thank you all for joining us today. Our vision with this project and this work is to build resiliency for Latinx owned farms. And we see this as a long-term goal that will be achieved through rich collaboration and innovation by changing existing systems and structures and by building new ones. This presentation primarily shares our findings from the first phase of our work together, which was a community needs assessment specifically around Spanish language business training and resources. We see this assessment as kicking off a longer term project that joins the work that many of you are already doing to address gaps and support for Spanish speaking Latinx farmers. I also wanna take this moment to acknowledge the sustainable communities funders who made this assessment possible through their generous financial support. Now I would like to introduce the project team and our organizations. Maya Hardy is the director of community food systems at Ecotrust and Jolima Rivera Vasquez is the food and farms coordinator at Ecotrust. Ecotrust is an environmental nonprofit that works across the Pacific Northwest, Alaska and Northern California in multiple natural resource sectors at the intersection of social equity, environmental conservation and resilient economies. Ecotrust runs an agriculture of the middle business accelerator program for farmers, ranchers and fishers that supports them with business development, growth and viability. And as I mentioned, I'm Anna Chotzen, business and marketing manager at Viva Farms. And Viva Farms is a farm business incubator and training program. Um, it's based in Skagit and King counties in Washington state. We empower beginning farmers to build thriving businesses by providing bilingual English Spanish training in holistic organic farming practices, as well as access to land, infrastructure, equipment, marketing, and capital. I would also like to acknowledge two other colleagues who contributed to this project. Rob Smith, who is the Director of Programs and Operations at Viva Farms, and Kate Smith, who is the Northwest Small Farm and Latino Support Coordinator for Washington State University Skagit County Extension. And I will now pass it over to Jolimar, who will outline the agenda for our time together. Thanks so much for being here. Here's just a quick uh, snapshot um, of the agenda for today. We will go over uh, the project background. We'll have a quick note on terminology that we use um, today and with our follow-up materials. Um, we'll have Maya talk a little bit about the methodology and amongst the three of us, we will present our results from our needs assessment. Um, so we did do interviews, a little bit of a heads up there <laughs> around the methodology, and those were both with farmers and service providers. After that, we'll make a pause to have a short Q&A about what we had just presented, and that will be a segue into a short summary on um, systemic barriers and challenges that were observed throughout this research. And that will lead us into a, a short um, time together in small groups to discuss uh, with some questions that we have for you, some prompts, and hopefully we'll be able to report back and talk about next steps. And next slide. Um, so a little bit about the project background. There is no doubt that Latinx farmers and farm workers play a crucial role in our country's food system and in the Pacific Northwest region. Um, just to start off, um, here are some stats for our region um, as context on why focus supporting Latinx owned farm businesses and their development. So I'm just gonna read these. 88% of farm workers in the Pacific Northwest are Latino, Latina, or Latinx and 3% of farmland in Skagit and King counties where this project was focused is Latino, Latina, or Latinx owned. So just take a pause there to, to process those stats um, around who works the land and who owns the land. So how this project came to be and why we did this, um, just a little bit of background on how Viva Farms and Ecotrust started to work together. So for those of you that don't know much about us, I'll talk about Viva Farms a little bit first. 
Viva Farms has been offering bilingual education and sustainable agriculture in Skagit and King counties for more than a decade. And Ecotrust Aga the Middle Accelerator Program has been focused on offering advanced business training to farmers, ranchers, and fishers in the states of Alaska, Washington, Oregon, and Northern California over the past five years. In recent years, Viva Farms identified that their Spanish-speaking participants are ready for more advanced business training than the type that they had historically offered. Um, so Viva Farms reached out to our Ecotrust out of the middle team. And after conversations, we had agreed both um, that our program, Ecotrust program is not currently accessible uh, due to language and cultural barriers. So from this, our two organizations started collaborating and hopes to build a new program to help Spanish speaking farmers gain intermediate and advanced business management skills. So leveraging the experience of each of our organizations, as well as relying on the expertise of other organizations and individuals that already support Spanish speaking businesses and farmers and farmers themselves. Uh, we conducted this needs assessment to identify gaps in resources and training in order to better serve Latinx Spanish speaking farmers in supporting the development of thriving and resilient businesses. So the slides that follow present our findings. Next slide. Oh, one note on terminology before we actually introduce our findings. Um, throughout today's presentation, and like I said, you'll see, receive some follow-up materials, a formal report and a copy of the presentation as well as the recording. You might see that Throughout today and in those, we use a number of terms to address the demographics of this project's audience. Generally speaking, we refer to the target farmer group as Latinx or Spanish speaking Latinx. And we purposely uh, use this term to be inclusive of both genders and racial background. That said, we recognize that these terms encompass a wide group of um, cultural, national, linguistic, ethnic, and historical diversity. We also recognize that Latinx is a term mainly known in the English language, and that some Spanish-speaking farmers may self-identify instead as Latino, Latina, Hispano, or Hispana. Also on occasions, we do use the term Hispanic when referencing census or survey data. Um, all of this to say that we recognize that the Latino, Latina, Latinx identities are complex, beautifully diverse, and not at all a monolith. Many of our target farmers and other Latinx also identify with their nationality of or origin instead, like Mexicano or Mexicana, or like myself, who um, I identify as Puerto Rican or Puerto Rican. Next slide. So now I will pass it on to Maya, who is going to tell us a little bit about the methodology used. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, so just a bit on methodology. So um, we, in, in crafting this project, we really drew on our prior experience with participatory research and referenced resources such as publications, training videos, um, that we had access to that really helped inform our methodology. Um, we chose an interview format versus another method such as an online survey. Oop, someone said it's hard to hear me. Can you hear me okay? Yes, hopefully, okay. Um, let me know and I can try and adjust my, my microphone. Um, we chose an interview format versus another method such as an online survey. Um, I think mostly because we really wanted to um, center the relationships that we have with farmers and with service providers and really use our interviews as an opportunity to build and strengthen those relationships. Um, we designed our interview questions collaboratively. So for farmers, we were really hoping to understand, to get an understanding of their business history, their priorities, barriers, and goals. And for service providers, we were aiming to identify the leading organizations that support Spanish speaking producers, um, understanding their needs, the opportunities that they see, and also gaps that might exist in technical assistance. Um, after doing interviews, we spent time going through and coding all of our interview notes and identifying general themes. 
So we did a thematic analysis that we will present to you today. All right, so uh, we will spend the next several minutes talking about the farmer interviews first, and then a little later, we'll talk about the results from the service providers. Next slide. So let's start with who did we interview? Uh, go ahead and click. We interviewed 11 businesses, 25 uh, business owners uh, comprised those 11 businesses, and that was about two to three partners per business. And um, out of those, 10 of them identified as women, 13 men, and two non-binary. Uh, the last thing in this slide, um, at least one of uh, the business owners or partners for each business uh, identified with Latino, Latina, or Latinx groups. When we um, talked with folks, uh, we did interviews in either Spanish or English, depending on their preference. And so the first graph on the left here represents the first language that the business owners or partners um, felt most comfortable with. You'll see that the majority of um, producers felt most comfortable in Spanish. So 18 of them followed by English with four people. And we did have three people total who felt most comfortable in their native indigenous language. Uh, two of them spoke mainly Mystic and one mom, but we did have those conversations in Spanish with them. Um, when we looked at crops that the businesses uh, cultivate, most of them, uh, 10 of them uh, grew vegetables, um, followed by seven businesses producing berries, um, followed by, uh, I think that's around three, uh, that produce culturally specific foods like Mexican varieties, Asian vegetables, and the such. Two businesses produce um, herbs, and one business uh, produced a value product, in which case was frozen berries. In terms of land tenure, um, the businesses we interviewed have been in operation anywhere from four to uh, 11 years. Six of the 11 businesses in, uh, interviewed um, have land through the Viva Farms incubator um, in either Skagit or King County. And collectively, um, or between all 11 businesses, they manage 116 acres total. Here is a graph of the one on the left talks about um, the locations where the farmers were, you'll see that um, for those that incubate at Viva Farms, five of them incubate in Skagit County. Um, there's one farmer in Whatcom County. There are three farmers somewhere else in Skagit County that was not Viva. One in Island County, one in Snohomish County, and out of the two of King County, one of them uh, was in the King County Viva Farms site. Um, when we looked at who leases and who owns land, I really like this graph because it's very obvious that most lease land and it's a, out of those 116 acres in management, are, about 100 are managed through leasing contracts. Um, only two businesses own land, so those are the dark uh, blue bars. And those were in total six, 17 acres. Um, and the, the other um, takeaway from this graph is that most farmers lease fewer than 10 acres. Next slide. Okay, I'll pass it to Anna, I think. <laughs> Sorry, I was on mute. Um, we also looked at labor and there's a lot to, a lot that we could pull out of the labor conversation and considerations. And these two graphs represent what we thought was a good demonstration of um, some indicators for the farmers we interviewed. On the left, we have the farm's contribution to household income. So you'll see that eight of the 11 producers we interviewed have at least one of the farm owners um, relying on an off-farm job to contribute to their household income. Only three of the 11 
um, gained or like earned all of their household income from their farm business. So that was, yeah, just an interesting, gives an interesting image of um, what folks, how, how the farm contributes to folks overall um, financial situation. And then on the right, we asked folks about hired labor. And as a lot of us probably know, labor is a challenge, um, probably always, and especially right now. And so what you see here is kind of the breakdown of who hires labor and what that looks like. Um, so three farmers, the blue represents three farmers who hired family members. And so it was a, a family only operation. Um, five hired non-family members as well. And then three reported having no employees at all. It was also interesting to ask farmers about the challenges that they see when it comes to labor, especially around hiring labor. Um, one piece of feedback was that as the minimum wage goes up, it's really challenging for small scale businesses to keep up. And I think that's something that probably any small business owner is experiencing and certainly including farmers. Um, in particular, this last year, several farmers talked about the challenge of managing and just keeping up on regulations around COVID protocols and requirements for personal protective equipment and sanitizing and whether or not they had to wear masks and all of that that goes along with, um, that is in addition to the rest of the regulations that they have to follow. Also filing paperwork and managing payroll and kind of the, all of the administrative work that goes along with hiring and having employees was noted as a challenge in the interviews. Um, one farmer mentioned that not having a way to have a formal timekeeping process, not having like a clock in clock out process for their employees was a challenge and something that they mentioned they would like to work on this coming season. And then the final challenge that was discussed was how to balance the need for labor and the need for you know having enough hands to do the work as they scale, but also at the same time keeping labor costs down. So that was mentioned as another challenge. And I'll pass it over to Maya. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, so I'm gonna to touch on the financial knowledge and financial management and capital access sections. Um, so in the interviews, we asked farmers to self-rate their financial knowledge and comfort with financial record keeping. <clears throat> so you can see the graph here um, on the left. One business had limited knowledge of financial record keeping and accounting, seven out of the 11. So 64% had some knowledge of accounting and financial record keeping. And for this group, you know, their responses or, or answers really indicated that they were actively learning their way around maintaining records and preparing financial statements and maybe reviewing financials quarterly or once a year. Um, and the financial statements really aren't being used as a management tool. Um, three of the farmers that we interviewed demonstrated a pretty strong grasp of farm finance and accounting concepts and we're engaging with the CPA on a semi-regular basis. Um, in terms of record keeping systems, um, only one farmer was using a paper only system and three of the farmers were exclusively using spreadsheets such as Excel, Google, Excel or Google Sheets to manage their financial records. And the majority of folks are using a combination of paper record keeping, entering that into Excel or giving paper records to a CPA or a tax preparer. Um, at the time of the interviews, no, none of the farmers were using QuickBooks themselves um, or another accounting software, though um, four of them expressed working with an accountant. Um, one farmer did mention wanting to start using QuickBooks this year. Um, and then another farmer had mentioned tracking records on paper, giving that information to their accountant for them to enter into QuickBooks. Um, in terms of challenges, oops, I don't can go back, sorry, thanks. In terms of challenges, I think this is a theme that you'll see throughout, um, finding a qualified accountant that speaks Spanish and understands the complexity of farm finance, um, 
is just a real challenge. And you'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this later on in the presentation, um, but definitely a major theme that came out of our analysis. And then um, in terms of a cost of production, um, 55% of the folks that we interviewed are tracking profitability or cost of production in some way, um, either by crop or um, at, through, as for the business as a whole. Um, the responses from the farmers didn't reflect whether they were factoring their labor into their cost, which is um, for diversified operations like vegetables or berries is oftentimes um, the highest cost of, of doing business. Um, the folks that aren't currently tracking their cost of production did express interest in doing that and see the importance, but um, I think the level of diversity of the crops that they're growing and the complexity of their market channels makes it difficult to do some of that analysis. Um, one farmer noted that they have an intuitive sense for profitability based on um, the number of years that they've been producing a crop. So, you know, if a farmer is growing green beans for five years or 10 years, they develop just intuition based on the number of years that they've grown um, a crop and can kind of make decisions based, based on that, that experience. Um, another farmer mentioned um, finding just like managerial accounting or that type of analysis to be challenging uh, because they're not strong in math. Next slide, please. So um, for capital access, the majority of the businesses that we interviewed, um, like most businesses, are financing with a combination of financing through off-farm jobs. So the slide that Anna was just presenting around off-farm income, um, they're reinvesting their profits, they have fa family and friends supports and are receiving grant funding or um, pursuing creative lending options through community-based lenders. Only two of the farmers that we interviewed have engaged with a financial institution and both shared um, difficulties communicating in English and um, understanding application forms, terms, and concepts that are being used by loan officers. Um, some of the farmers mentioned citizenship status as a barrier to accessing traditional financing. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. Um, one of the businesses that we interviewed had applied for a loan and was denied. Um, they didn't give us a reason for decline, but it was clear through um, their responses that that experience has affected um, just the way that they are pursuing financing for their business in the future. Um, one business is, has engaged in a lease to own arrangement for, um, for their farm to acquire land and then was able after four years to refinance um, that lease to own arrangement with a bank. Next slide. So 45% um, <clears throat> of the farmers that we interviewed are interested in pursuing financing, but um, are facing some pretty significant barriers to doing so. Um, the first is inability to qualify for sufficient financing to meet their goals. So for example, one farmer shared that they would like to purchase land, but can only qualify for 400,000, which is insufficient for the size of property that they want to buy. Um, there's concern about being unable to access financing due to immigration status or not being a US citizen or permanent resident. Um, I know that some CDFIs are able to make loans to folks who aren't US citizens or permanent residents um, but it could be potentially a disconnect between um, what the farmer perceives and in reality for some lenders. Um, I think there's also, it was, it was clear that there's also an aversion to taking on debt, which um, seemed to be connected to the uncertainty around um, not being able to repay a loan. And it was mentioned a couple times that, I mean, I think this is in particular interesting when we think about climate change, but um, you know, just farmers being fearful that their yields maybe aren't gonna be what they thought or that there's just kind of a fear generally of their profitability not being what they thought and not consequently not being able to, to repay a loan. Another challenge that was expressed is um, just trauma from family history, um, in particular with bankruptcy or credit challenges. And I think it's really interesting 
for me kind of nerding out with capital access just to think about the connections between personal finance and business finance. And um, I know when I was working for a CDFI, predatory lenders were super prevalent um, within the underserved communities, BIPOC communities and low income communities. Um, it wasn't expressed in our interviews, but it's just interesting to kind of think about those connections between um, where folks are able to access credit or capital um, and some of the experiences that they may have had historically. Um, and then lastly, um, if one farmer expressed the, that USDA grant programs or grant funding are not accessible due to the amount of funding that is needed to match the grants. Um, and so there's you know, a variety of USDA programs that, that can support farmers and many of them do require match and um, this can be a barrier for folks. Next slide. Um, so we asked farmers um, what types of financing mechanisms they desired. And um, you can see here the, the common themes were low interest loans, creative loan options, and multi-year grant funding. And so as an example of a creative loan option, several farmers that we interviewed were recipients of a community development block grant program in Skagit County that provided loans up to 35,000 to low income farmers to purchase infrastructure or, or equipment. And the farmers were able to repay those loans on a five to 10 year term in the form of produce to their local food bank, um, which is a super innovative um, lending model where, you know, in many cases, I think two of the farmers, maybe more, that we interviewed were able to use this lending program to buy a tractor and then were able to repay that loan in the form of produce um, to the food bank, which is just a really incredible model of you know, local food going into our local food bank system and also um, helping to support farmers and, and purchasing pretty substantial assets that can transform their business model. Um, another farmer had shared that a multi-year grant um, of like 15 to 25 a year for three years would be a really helpful injection of capital that would allow them to invest in assets and pursue farming as a career. Um, and so again, just kind of an interesting, interesting way to think about, um, you know, farmers as like really critical folks in our community that are, that are providing a public service. And so are there potentially grant programs that we can develop that would support them over a series of, of years to, to become sort of stable and viable, invest in assets and actually um, potentially be able to leave their off farm job at some point. And that's all I got for that. Yeah, so when we asked a little bit about land access, um, 27% of the interviewees express that they're currently seeking additional land um, besides where they own or lease. And the remainder of those folks that weren't currently seeking land, they still shared that um, they wanted to seek land in the future. So that was 73%. Um, when we asked folks what the ideal acreage uh, was for them, the average was 19 acres but the responses ranged from anywhere between 10 to 37 acres. We also asked, um, similar to like, what is the best financial model for you? We asked, what is your preferred land access model? And you can see in this um, pie chart that the majority of folks wanted to own land. So that's the green uh, pie slice with eight people, um, two folks, uh, talk specifically about a cooperative or collective type of model. And the other folks are really least to own. You'll see that the blue pie slice, it has an asterisk and this represents the long-term lease as an asterisk because uh, everyone that said that wanted that in the near term with the option to own. So those three folks are included in the red pie slice. And then of course, uh, when we asked about um, land access, uh, 
a number of barriers came up. The most common one being affordability, which is closely related to the challenge of qualifying for and acquiring sufficient capital, kind of like what Maya was talking about. But other challenges also included the lack of relationships and connections. And um, partly, that, partly that was because folks didn't know where to go to um, help them find land, but also because of the language. Uh, that being um, not being fluent English speakers. The other barriers that came up was folks weren't really willing or certain for folks weren't willing to um, go through the expense and the challenge of converting what they call raw land into farmable land. So land that wasn't farmed before, uh, it takes a lot, right? Money and, and time and um, resources to do that. And the last barrier was on-site resources. So like when they look for a piece of land, are they gonna have water rights or access to water in general or the ability to build infrastructure that they need on site? We also asked about sales and marketing and we were just curious to know where folks um, are selling and through what channels. So you'll see on this graph, seven out of the 11 sold to either farmers markets or included here are also farm stands or other direct to consumer stands, you know, at events or in front of their house. Um, two farmers had their own CSA programs and four farmers sold through wholesale programs or through distributors. And in the case of the distributors, um, in all cases, those distributors were either Viva Farms, we have an aggregation and distribution program, or the Puget Sound Food Hub, which is a local food hub in Skagit County here in Washington. We also asked about barriers to sales, and in the interest of time, I won't read through this whole slide. Um, I hope that you'll get a chance to look at it when we send this out, but some of the, the highest level challenges were that farmers reported in any case were challenges with not speaking English and that making it hard to communicate with buyers, um, as well as the challenges of the customers not knowing the farmers, whether that was at a farmer's market and then not going to their stand or whether it was in, you know, if they didn't recognize their name in the grocery store and therefore not buying their product, but lack of familiarity in general, folks mentioned as a, a barrier. Um, technology was another one. And there are some others that um, we'll, we'll just leave. And I hope that you can dig into it when you get this presentation in your email. Um, so like we had shared in the beginning, um, when we first started collaborating, our hope was to build some sort of program in the near future that could address some of these gaps and barriers. Um, so we did ask questions about what an ideal program should look like. Um, so the next few slides are around program design. This one is about curriculum content. And we asked folks to name their top three areas that they felt like they really needed some immediate support in order to continue to develop and grow and be, be viable in the long term. So I won't go through all of these, but these were the top. Um, you can see that accounting and bookkeeping was the most uh, often mentioned, followed by farm taxes. If you click Anna on the next uh, animation, I wanted to point out that computer classes and English classes here are scored four and two, but this was remember when we asked folks, what would be your top three areas or topics that you want in a program? Um, that, however, we did ask explicitly uh, to each farmer, do you want to learn about computer classes? Do you want to learn about English classes? And when we did that, 100% of people, so everybody said yes to computer classes, and seven of them, so over half, said yes to English classes. We also asked what type of preferred training they wanted, and most folks wanted an in-person training. You'll see in the other bars that there was some indication that some folks would be comfortable with a virtual setting but for the majority of folks, they prefer in person. There were also a few other uh, wants in a program. In terms of the language, uh, 
again, most of the folks we interview were in Spanish, so Spanish or bilingual was preferred. Uh, I like the to quote that one of the producers that we spoke to in English said or recognized that you know one of their partners or other farmers that they know um, whether um, I'm sorry even though he prefers to speak in English and communicate in English, he knows that other of his colleagues um, can only do Spanish. So he wanted a bilingual training um, and he was not the other one. There were others too. Um, people really wanted visual presentation, like visual presentations, videos. Um, although there was one person for whatever reason <laughs> that they didn't like videos. Um, Folks also want to learning objectives up front. And I think that was in relation to wanting to know what they were getting into, like the specifics of the program. Um, there was a lot about applied knowledge. So like the theory and practice and having workbooks and study guides and resources, all either in Spanish or bilingual, and also learning from peers and visiting other farms. Um, we didn't explicitly ask about one-on-one coaching, but it did come up as a theme from several farmers that they wanted that one-on-one -on -one technical assistance. Um, and in terms of the time, uh, pretty much everybody, almost 100% said winter, right? And that makes sense because that's when the growing season is not as um, active. And they specifically said months between October and February the frequency varied quite a lot. That's how often they wanted to meet be between those months. And some folks said, you know, once or twice a week to twice every month to once a month. So it depends. We also asked about uh, who, who should teach these courses. And here are some of the um, themes that came up. Of course, bilingual, English and Spanish. Um, they wanted a person who either identified as Latinx or a person with experience engaging with multicultural groups. And we put here female prefer because two of the businesses actually spoke of the instructor as a maestra, or which is a female teacher, or spoke about examples of previous um, instructors from other programs that they like and they were female. Uh, a few other things. Uh, also, we did not explicitly ask about a cost for the program. That said, one of the farmers did express at the end of the interview that they wanted to let us know that they wish this program would be free. Also, uh, Viva Farms engages one-on-one uh, -on -one with farmers in their um, incubator, and they have regular meetings and evaluations where they have expressed to want the continuation of free programming. Um, in the beginning of our collaboration, we had envisioned a multi-year program. So we asked the question about whether they would commit to a two to three year training and nine out of 11 said yes. And in terms of when, um, besides winter and how often folks, um, most folks seem to prefer in the evenings. Uh, we also asked what other uh, needs would be useful for uh, a program and childcare, food, and making just uh, accommodations to be inclusive came up as well. And some barriers um, came up too, and I think we've addressed some of these. Again, majority aren't fluent in English, so um, that's a barrier uh, for current or available trainings. Um, not everybody has a computer. Uh, most, if not everyone, seem to have access to internet, uh, either through their phone or a computer, but the, they really uh, express a limitation with technology skills. They brought up examples where, you know, they said, that, oh, my son handles that, or my sister handles that, or somebody else does that for me. And we noticed that they described the, they wanted an in-person training mostly because a virtual training seemed distracting from home or they didn't have the ability or the skills to join virtually. And finally for the farmers, <laughs> so we can switch to the service providers. Um, we asked about their goals and the one goal that was, um, that came up for every single farmer 
We did ask about goals in the immediate term in two years or five years plus, and everybody said land in each of those blocks. Um, but also we had a few other shared goals amongst all the participants, and those were these ones regarding having their farm business be their primary livelihood, ability to pay and hire employees, and expanding their business to increase profits. Great. We're going to transition now to discuss our service provider interviews. And um, there's we have a lot less content in that, so it should go quicker so that we'll have time for our community discussion as well. So who did we interview? We interviewed eight service providers, and they, they came from wide backgrounds, um, wide geographies even, and they represented three main areas of expertise. Three of them um, were really in the land access space. Eight were in business advising and training um, and various, you know, that can be, that's quite wide ranging. And so they, we had some who were independent consultants, some who were business coaches, others who were part of nonprofits who support entrepreneurs and businesses, not necessarily farmers, but business owners in general. And then four were in the land, or excuse me, in the capital access space. So lenders, micro lenders, um, and different folks who also work with lenders and help farmers and business owners access capital. In terms of language capacity, we asked the service providers if they what languages they provide their services in with particular focus on whether or not they offer Spanish language support. So five said that they were completely bilingual, that they either they themselves were or they had sufficient staff um, that was totally bilingual. Two said that they, they or their organization could offer limited support in Spanish. And then one organization offered services in English only. Some general themes that came out of the conversations we had with them, um, we, we did ask about their fees for service and seven reported that they do charge for service, um, but all said that they have either free services or discounted payment plans or discounted rates for farmers and small businesses. A lot of the, the organizations and individuals we interviewed also do consulting work and so they may have a fee or a charge if they're working with say another nonprofit, but then when they work with directly with the stakeholders, um, that is free of charge. They all have experience supporting business owners with limited technology, which was a specific question we asked. Um, they also are all experienced with both virtual and in-person training, which I'm sure was particularly true after this last year. And then we did ask about folks' interest in engaging in a potential program that we develop and specifically their interest in, in collaborating on the fundraising side of that. And five of the eight said that they would be interested and able to participate and collaborate in fundraising. So just as we asked farmers about um, their program design desires and expectations, um, we asked similar question of the service providers and ask for their feedback on what they think would be really necessary and critical to have in any sort of program we develop. So childcare and food came up um, for the service providers as well. And one service provider also mentioned the importance of in providing food, also sourcing that food from Latinx farmers and or Latinx food businesses. So that was feedback that we got. The one-on-one -on -one coaching piece also came up as something that from, from these service providers experience that one-on-one -on -one coaching is a really effective way to support small scale producers and businesses. Um, we talked a lot about the barriers to land access and the importance of addressing those barriers and the service providers in various different interviews um, address that point in different ways. Um, and then we also got feedback that it's really important to consider the expertise that the farmers themselves have in business management and training and to really lean on that and lean into that as we're thinking about what we develop and that it isn't just that expertise comes from the service providers or the advisors or coaches, but that that expertise really lies within the producers themselves as well.
All right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So now we're going to take a pause and um, we have about seven to 10 minutes to answer any questions that you have on our um, interview results and analysis. And after this, we are going to go into a community conversation about the structural barriers that we identified um, through our interviews. So if you have a question for us, please feel free to um, ask that question in the chat or raise your hand. Um, feel free to unmute yourself, whatever works best for you. And I'm gonna just unshare for a moment so um, we can all see each other. Um, sorry, let me just pull it up. That way we can, if you do wanna just open up to the community and speak up, you're welcome to do so. Addie is asking, what surprised you the most about this research? Julie or Anna, do you wanna? I can, yeah, I can chime in. Honestly, what surprised me the most was, especially from the farmer interviews, was how much interest there is in having a course of some sort. I really the purpose of this whole assessment was to see if farmers would even be interested in doing any kind of formal course and if that would be useful to them. And the, the overwhelming response was that yes, it would be, and yes, they were interested in engaging. And that was kind of surprising to me because I think of farmers as being busy and maybe kind of over courses and just wanting to get on with it. And so that was really good feedback because I think it, it indicated to me like, okay, we have it's worth you know putting the effort into a course that fits their needs because there's demand. Julie, do you have anything you want to share? Sure. Um, I think um, it was not necessarily a surprise as in like, well, I know that I, I feel like through conversations outside of this needs assessment formally. Um, I had heard about land being a big component of like folks goals and I guess what I'm trying to say is like it was interesting to see like the barriers around uh, land matched up with the financial aspects and capital access uh, to in order to be able to access land or expand right because a lot of them are on leases and so that was just the most interesting part for me. Mike is asking, did any of the interviews express interest in value add opportunities to capture more of the margin? And if so, what types of infrastructure would they need? I didn't analyze any of those sections, but I feel like that might be like Anna for the sales and marketing piece. I don't know if that came up for you. Yeah, I'm thinking about that. It didn't, it didn't come up a lot. I wouldn't I wouldn't take that to mean that there's not interest in value add and more that the way we worded the questions didn't prompt folks to speak to that as much. Um, we had we had one farm that specifically, that already does some value added with frozen berries and specifically said that they're interested in doing more of that. But beyond that, we didn't get a lot into what that would look like. Thank you. Um, Jana is asking a question. To what extent did the farmers or service providers raise challenges or opportunities related to sustainable farming methods? Hmm. That didn't come up in any of the, not the financial or capital access analysis. But yeah, it didn't come up much. Again, I think in part, well, I, I mean, I, I should preface and we didn't we didn't really make this explicit in the beginning, but all of the farmers that we interviewed are either certified organic or using organic and sustainable practices. And that's that's by virtue of them either being part of Viva Farms program where organic production is required or them being part of our orbit. And like generally the farmers that we support are organic or sustainably 
organically or sustainably produced, um, you know, product and businesses. Um, so it was a little bit of like, we kind of took that as a given and then didn't discuss much about the more agricultural production side of people's businesses. So yeah, it didn't, in, in that sense, it didn't come up, but I would say it's, it's, uh, it's implied that it is a significant consideration for all of the businesses that were interviewed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only thing I could think of that came up in some of the analysis that I did was related to record keeping. So for folks that um, are USDA or organic certi or organic certified even, um, they're required to keep records of their yields and their sales. And so um, it was kind of interesting to have farmers kind of reflect on like their record keeping that's kind of mandated from their certification and how that may help them in some ways like solidify their record keeping systems and how they're tracking their yields and finances. Um, it, it could potentially motivate them to um, kind of, yeah, solidify or, or um, yeah, just come up with a system that, that makes sense for them that, that's related to the organic cert. Um, let's see, there's a lot of questions rolling in here. Daniela. Just a, re a response to Daniela. Um, I saw Joe Lamar responded in the chat, but to your question about the youth, one thing that was interesting that is not really reflected in our data, but several farms said that a lot of their record keeping is done by their children. And so a takeaway for us was, okay, next step is to interview the kids who are actually doing the record keeping to see how they would answer these questions. And so it definitely speaks to how integral they are to, especially the businesses that are managed mostly by family and that they, you know, they're providing potential careers for the next generation. Yeah, so I have that same experience. I, I also have a farm education, but in, in Oregon, um, and I work with Latinx farmers and it's the same experience. Like I end up working with their kids a lot. Uh, yeah, like, especially the kids who are like in the middle school, high school age range where they're taking care of that part of the, uh, family's need, the technology, literacy, the English access, that kind of stuff. Um, and so that's something that we're considering in our program to expand a kind of youth training program or something where it can include all of these business skills as well. So I'm curious to continue connecting about this. All right, let's take one more question here. I see a question, Jessica, it looks like Julie, you answered that. Steve is asking, it is often a sensitive slash personal subject to raise, but did anyone express concern about overall literacy in general in any language? Many have had their traditional educations cut short, including women, girls, level of formal education opportunities. What? We didn't ask about ling um, education level specifically. Um, as Maya mentioned in an earlier slide, at least one, if not several farmers did mention that financial record keeping can be challenging and daunting because of their, what they feel is like a, a lower math literacy or numeracy level. Um, and then people definitely talked about computer literacy level and how that they felt that that was a, it was a challenge that they don't have a lot of experience using technology and using computers. Other than that, I don't remember that we really spoke specifically about education, but I'd be curious if others have thoughts. Yeah, um, we didn't specifically ask about education. I agree with that, but um, just along the lines of computers, computer literacy. Uh, I mean, people re they give examples about what they use and they mention like, okay, I can search in the internet for something. I can enter Facebook, I can enter Instagram. Those were the examples. If you send me a link, I can click on it. Uh, those were the specific examples, nothing else, like not even Excel was brought up, which I know some of them seem to be using it, um, but maybe it's a family member that is actually in, in the data um, or the use. Um, 
the other thing I wanted to share was um, for uh, the the farmer that spoke mom was very um, quiet a lot of the time um, and we had to uh, I don't know I, I, I did that interview and I know that um, it was I had to bring it up like it was actually several of the business owners or partners and uh, some of them that were more like in the works of the accounting and like the computers um, were more uh, proactive about answering the questions. And then I would also repeat the questions specifically to them. Um, and they were like, more like, no, I just, I are really more on the land piece and like farming itself and don't really understand like computers or the numbers or even some of the language that we were discussing around accounting and, and such. Great. Thank you guys so much. There's a few questions that we didn't have time to get to, um, but we can maybe compile some answers and send them out when we follow up with notes and presentation and report following this session. Um, so now we're going to transition into a community conversation. I'm going to post a link in the chat to a um, document that has the high level barriers and challenges that we identified through our research. Um, and I believe Anna is gonna bring it up on the screen here for us as well. Um, we're gonna break out into three breakout groups. Myself, Jolimar and Anna are gonna be facilitating. And we have three questions that we would love to discuss with you. And those three questions are, um, what's resonating for you out of this, um, you know, are there things that we're missing based on your experience working with Latinx farmers? We have folks on the call that, that definitely serve this community. Um, are there things that we're missing or things that are really resonating for you? Um, how would you address the barriers and challenges? And who would you engage? Who needs to be at the table? Um, I think our, our hope is that this is kind of one of many conversations that we will have around addressing some of these structural barriers and um, would love to get your thoughts on who needs to be at the table and who should be engaged in these conversations. Thank you so much for participating in our community discussion. Um, we're just going to take a couple minutes and do some reflecting um, as to what we heard in our groups, what was shared in our groups, um, and I'll, I'll just kick us off. Um, we had a great conversation. The time went quick, so it definitely made me feel like we need to have more of these conversations. Um, but um, there was, we had Alex from NABC really just emphasize the importance of technology literacy. And um, he mentioned that NABC is offering, um, offering classes and there's a huge need that's just not stopping. And so just really um, kind of emphasize and underlined that, that need for continuing to provide that support and potentially expand that support. Um, Addie from AFT was um, kind of reflecting on the, the land access models that were desired and um, was kind of reflecting on how I think only two of the farmers expressed an interest in a cooperative model and was curious if um, that was because there's a lack of education around that. And, um, and then we had a great conversation about some of the work that, that da David Mancera from Kitchen Table Advisors is doing related to um, land access. And it sounds like KTA is, is looking at some philanthropic capital to finance a piece of land and then support five to six farmers to own um, 20 to 30 acres. So that's what was shared in my group. And Anna or Julie, do you want, you want to report back? Sure. Um, we had a lot to talk about and we mostly spent time in the first question. <laughs> um, but in terms, here's some notes that I took. Um, there was, a, it felt like the results um, felt like af affirmation um, of things they've heard over the past several years, particularly around the technology piece and the need for bilingual services. Um, we had a, a quick discussion around, um, or comments around what a lot of, that is, it is a lot of effort to fight 
to find the right land for each farmer and like all the complexities around it. Um, there was a, a high need for expanding on the creative finance portion, like the example used in Skagit, and can we just do more of that? And CIE wants to be involved on that. <laughs> um, we, uh, some, some folks talk about opportunities to increase the supply chain locally and explore a lot of um, value-added uh, opportunities. Um, the need for like, for continuing support of like some sort of facilitation for, especially for the market pieces, um, not just in the language, but kind of like value chain coordination. And for another person, uh, the childcare piece was very intriguing and they suggested um, that it might be interesting to look into a women's only conversation forum type of thing uh, that are uh, for women farmers. Um, we did had to, um, well, somebody suggested that Skagit County needs an inclusive value chain analysis and that the rural initiative development should be involved. Awesome. Thanks, Julie. Anna, you're muted. <laughs> I was just saying an inclusive value chain analysis for Skagit County sounds like a good challenge. Um, we also had a great conversation. Something that resonated with some folks in our group was um, the idea that the kids are helping with the technology and kind of administrative management of the business. And um, one of one participant in our group who is the daughter herself of farmers said that that was her experience as a child. And so she can really um, represent and um, relate to that. And in terms of um, addressing barriers and um, yeah, just it kind of leads into also who should be at the table and whom we should engage. Um, youth came up again as um, a kind of just a general demographic or group of people who can help address those barriers along the lines of supporting farmers and you know the, the parents who may not have the technology or numeracy or literacy skill sets. Um, we talked a little bit about CFAP2 and the somebody brought up the, the CFAP2 program, which is without going into detail, it's a coronavirus assistance program that farmers have access to. And somebody brought up that the USDA put out a informational video about that program, but it was only in English. And so we were talking about would it be worth trying to figure out how to get that into Spanish. Um, and then in terms of who should be at the table, um, somebody brought up academic institutions and they they were really connecting to noticing the gap or like the, the need that farmers expressed around wanting support from whether it's accountants or lawyers or realtors that possibly academic institutions who could provide, you know, an accounting student or a law student who might be able to help um, yeah, help farmers navigate these more complex issues. And then kind of along similar lines, somebody reminded us that there are different associations like the Hispanic Association of Accountants, Hispanic Association of MBAs, um, and others that might be worth um, engaging with. Um, and then there was also a question, we kind of ended our conversation with a question about what are the places, like the physical places in the world where Latinx folks gather that would be worth us um, thinking about as, you know, like physical spaces that we go to engage. So that, yeah, that's a summary of our conversation. Great, thank you. Do you mind sharing our last slide? Mm -hmm. Get to next steps. Sorry, there we go. All right, so <clears throat> we are, um, as a next step, going to be publishing our report and um, presentation, and we'll be sending it out to all of the attendees that joined the call today. And um, I believe we will also be um, posting it publicly on at least EcoTrust website and um, hopefully Viva Farms website as well. Um, we are going to be kicking off a co-creative curriculum development process 
Um, Viva Farms did receive a grant, um, the Extension Risk Management Education Grant, to start piloting some of the pieces of curriculum that we might want to, um, to incorporate into a more comprehensive program. So we are working with Deb Nades, who is on the call with us today, to um, start piloting some curriculum and do some design work, um, curriculum design work. And our intention is to engage the service providers that um, participated in our interview process as well in um, expanding our creative curriculum development process. And really, I think the goal is for us to be as inclusive as possible um, and really bring in the folks that were a part of our interview process that expressed a desire to fundraise with us and collaborate with us. So stay tuned um, for, more, um, for more on that. And then we are also gonna be working to identify bilingual service providers. So um, accountants, CPAs, bookkeepers, capital providers, lawyers, so um, if you identify a, as a service provider that's listed, we would love to hear from you um, and, and potentially plug you into our program development process as well. And then, um, you know, the conversation we just had was, was awesome. And I think our hope is that we can have more of these types of conversations. And so if you're interested in continuing to um, potentially convene or discuss or collaborate with Ecotrust and Viva, on addressing some of these larger structural barriers, we would really love to hear from you and, and really plug you into our work. So if you can go to the next slide, Anna, here's our email. Um, there's my email, Joel Lamar and Anna, and um, feel free to reach out to any one of us or all three of us, and we will plug you into our process, our project, and would love to stay in touch. So thank you all so much for joining. Um, and really appreciate the support and, and your presence today. So before we close out, um, Julie or Anna, do you have any parting words that you'd like to share? I would just echo the thanks. It really is, it's yeah, just great to see this pretty sizable and diverse group of people on this call. And it's really exciting to think about all of us who care about this work. So thanks a lot for spending the afternoon with us and I would just reiterate that this we're really envisioning that this work is long term and that in many ways it plugs into work that you all are already doing and the grant that Viva has in partnership with Ecotrust and Debnades is one step in furthering this work but really will rely on this larger community to push this forward and really build build new new systems and change the system as it is so that we're really supporting these producers. So um, really encourage you to engage like Maya said. Um, thank you again to everyone. And I would just add that my hope as well is that we could also, as we, you know, with, with this Ermi grant um, pilot uh, curriculum development that we'll be, you know, testing and iterating and piloting more and like, you know, adapting and being emergent through the process uh, to really be able to support our farmers. So I hope that some of you will join us. Great. Well, thank you all so much. And I hope you have a wonderful evening.